So, my teenage daughter came home from school one day. She stopped by my office to let me know that she was going to go to a friend's house. So I said, have you finished your homework? And she said, yeah, I'm done my homework. And I said, hey. So I'm a lexicographer. I write and edit dictionaries for a living. That means that I take language very seriously. And like any parent, who takes language very seriously and then hears something totally ungrammatical come out of their child's mouth, I decided to take the high road. I corrected her. I said, no, 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 not I'm done my homework. I'm done with my homework. And because my daughter is a teenager and also has a mother who's a lexicographer, she said, Right, I'm done my homework. <laughs> now, she wasn't sassing me, or she wasn't just sassing me. She was doing something very subtle. She was reminding me about the importance of her linguistic identity, her dialect. So dialects are these little subsets of a language. They usually have their own vocabulary, their own grammar. They even have their own accents. If you're aware of dialects at all, it's probably the regional ones. So American English, British English, Southern, whatever it is they speak in Boston. <laughs> Love you, Boston. But dialects can also be sliced up in myriad other ways. Dialects can be divided by race and ethnicity, by age, by occupation, by state of life even by immigration status. That means that dialects are actually linguistic identity markers. They tell you something about the speaker, and most people speak multiple dialects. And because they're identity markers, they have been historically weaponized. So, about 300 years ago, English grammarians put forth a radical idea about language, something that had never been thought of before. And that is that the way some people speak is intrinsically better than the way other people speak. Now, prior to this, you spoke the way you spoke. Your dialect was your dialect, and there was really no judgment placed on it. But after this, the way that educated upper-class city dwellers spoke was held up as being elegant, refined, educated, and even in some cases, morally good. And by extension, the people who spoke that dialect, the educated upper-class city dialect, those people were also elegant, refined, and morally good. This is the beginning of what we know as proper English. If you spoke proper English, you were proper. And if you didn't speak proper English, you did not speak that dialect, then you were not so proper. So how does this play out into the language today? Let's talk irregardless. <laughs> now, you all, as soon as I said irregardless, went bleh. <laughs> and you immediately began the great litany of insults that irregardless has enacted unto the English language. It's not a word. It's illogical, it's uneducated, therefore, we hate it. But here's the thing. Irregardless is none of those things. It is most certainly a word. Regret to inform you of that. Is it illogical? Well, it's no more illogical than inflammable to mean flammable and unthaw to mean thaw, but no one is burning down grocery stores because their frozen chicken package says to unthaw in the refrigerator. And is it uneducated? Irregardless shows up in the oral arguments of Supreme Court cases. And those lawyers are pretty highly educated. There is another reason why we have learned to hate irregardless. And that is because about 300 years ago, when irregardless first showed up, it was a dialect word. Irregardless is native to the dialects of the Upper Midwest and the Great Lakes region. And irregardless was mostly used at that point by country folk. 
And because it was used only by country folk and only in one small part of the country, and it was not part of this broader, educated, elegant dialect that we now think of as standard English, that meant that irregardless was ripe for mocking, and the people who used it were also ripe for mocking. Now, we think of English as this big, monolithic, static thing. But that's not actually an accurate way of looking at the language. English is a lot more like a river. When you look at it, it looks like one cohesive ribbon of water. But it's actually made up of dozens, sometimes even hundreds, of different currents. And each of those currents in that river is doing its own thing. Some move fast. Some move slow. Some even move in the opposite direction that the river is flowing. But the thing is that if you take away one current from a river, it will alter the entire river, its ecosystem, its direction, even its general health. Dialects are the currents that make up English. Now, we have been raised to think of one dialect, standard English, as English. But in fact, English will only thrive if it is made up of all of the dialects. What this means, then, is when someone says something like irregardless to you and you correct them, you are actually flattening English into something that it is not. In its original uses, irregardless was actually an emphatic form of regardless. And it was used to end conversation so there was no more argument about a point. So a typical sentence is, regardless of x and irregardless of y, z. Now, to nerds and linguists like me, that's actually a very delicate and a beautiful grammatical function. Irregardless has a purpose, even if it's not in your dialect even if it's not in standard English. The other thing we do when we correct people's speech is we don't just flatten the language. We flatten people. I'm done my homework. Now, this is typical of Philadelphia English. And everyone of every age, every education level, pretty much every socioeconomic bracket uses it. But that's not why I'm done my homework is important. It's important because when my daughter says to me, I'm done my homework, she's communicating something to me about who she is, something intimate. She's telling me that even though she was born and spent most of her life in New England, she considers Philadelphia home. And she's also saying something else about our relationship. She knows that I'm done my homework is not standard English. She knows that I'm done with my homework is how she would speak to a teacher or what she would write in a paper. But she's comfortable enough in our relationship that she can relax into her linguistic identity and say to me, I'm done my homework. When I correct her, I'm not telling her what standard English is. She knows what it is. What I'm communicating to her is that her linguistic identity is not as good as my linguistic identity. <laughs> Rivers need to flow. English as a river is kind of crazy. It's wild, it's rushing, it kind of goes all over the place just like its speakers. And lots of people panic about that and feel like we got to bring it in, folks. But the thing is, is that when you start constricting a river, when you dam it, things downstream die. Cultures, relationships, people. Your particular dialect, no matter how it is judged, is your linguistic identity. So I want to challenge you today. When someone says, irregardless, in your presence, as they no doubt will, I want to challenge you to not take that as an opportunity to correct them. I guarantee that if they use irregardless as part of their native dialect, they know it's not part of standard English. I would instead encourage you to see that as an invitation. That is an invitation to intimacy. It is an invitation to know a 
specific piece of them to swim in a current of English that you may not know anything about. Regardless of how you feel about another person's dialect, it is integral to who they are. So don't smash it. Let them speak them. And the ear, regardless of whether you think it's worth putting yourself out there or worth trying to educate people about your own native dialect, you have the right to be you. You should speak you. Thank you. <laughs>